Hello, my name is Sunita Banstawala from Learners Hub Mumbai. I am the senior creative writing facilitator. This story is called The Traumatic Surgery. It is a true story of my life. The story is about a young girl and her mother who experienced a traumatic surgery. The father is admitted in hospital because he suffers a brain condition which could paralyze him for life. But did it? The story begins. The drumming sirens drummed in my ears in this raucous African city Mogadishu in Somalia. The crimson red lights of the ambulance alerted the morning sea of traffic to give way as father was semi-conscious and suffering to breathe. My heart pounded with beats of te terror, threat and anxiety along with the deep prayer as we reached the hospital gates. The ambulance doors busted open and four male nurses hopped onto their feet as quick as kangaroos. They swiftly pulled father onto the stretcher and dashed into the emergency ward at this poverty chicken medical center called the African Trauma Hospital. My heart was in my mouth as I watched the four muscular nurses lift father, still in the semi-conscious state, from the stretcher onto the hospital bed. Four female nurses scurried into the room and started a monitor which looked like a small television screen next to him. They simultaneously surrounded the bed, poked razor-sharp needles into father's thick fair skin and deep into his purple-violet veins. On the sight of seeing blood drawn into the syringe, tears rolled down my cheeks. On the spur of the moment, a young African nurse dressed in a pure white dress peered into my sorrowful eyes. With her gentle eyes, she reassuringly said, Don't worry, little one. Your father is with the best medical team. She held my 13-year-old hand, ushered me outside the emergency ward and closed the doors. Now my bloodshot eyes peered through a dainty circular window, pane of the door. I felt every urge to rush in and help. Yet I was totally helpless. Next, father's mouth was covered with a plastic mask which resembled an inflating and deflating balloon. This mask was connected to father's supposedly life machine, which had a flaming red and a jade green light blinking one below the other, moving with a crooked ragged line from left to right on it. But what was it? All of a sudden, father's eyes began to close slowly and suddenly they were tightly shut. I slowly murmured with shock. Father is unconscious. I was terrified. A thousand horrendous thoughts ran through my 13-year-old stress mind. Had I lost father? Did father stop breathing? Did the nurses do something wrong? Where were the doctors? I felt blood boiling with anger and aghast. Just as I was about to blast towards father's room and give a piece of my mind to those nurses, I caught a glimpse of a tall aged doctor walking at the speed of light. He barged through the door and grabbed father's reports. I felt somewhat at ease, finally. The doctor scrutinized the report with his grey eyes, with a Somalian matron standing right beside him and called me into the room. With a heavy heave of breath, the doctor began to explain the diagnosis of father's report. My name is Dr. Richard Johansson, the neurosurgeon. Your father will be under my care for his brain and vitals. As of now, his vitals are fine. I felt a huge relief that father was safe, but still had a pestering notion that father was in trouble. But what kind of trouble, especially in the Somalian hospital with limited resources, so I questioned Dr. Johansson, what do you mean by vitals, doctor? The doctor replied, my innocent young child, vitals are blood pressure, heart rate and other important factors. It is highly necessary that your father's body must respond to the medicines given to him. I nodded and looked deeper into his skillful eyes, waiting for further information. Dr. Johansson slowly continued. We will be sending your father to have an MRI done just to check for any brain problems. Thereafter, we will call your mother 
and see what she has to say. With a deep heart, I sighed and prayed for all to be good. The next moment, father was dressed into a white gown with threads tied at the back, still in an unconscious state. He was reeled into a huge, cold and silent room with a cold, colossal whitewash electric machine. The nurses placed father on the steel bed and stood to the side. The uproar of the machine was extremely noisy as father was moving into this crux of this electronic medical magnet. In this palatal room of where the MRI machine was, I gawped with anticipation. My eyes blinked at the triplet of Somalia's experienced medical staff. The first specialist recorded the machine's crimson, red and royal blue lines. The second doctor examined the father's brain neurons and the third physician wrote the discoveries of the MRI scan. The complex examination was finally done. The reports were printed, enveloped and delivered to Dr. Johansson with the words embedded, urgent. Father was reeled out of that dreadful machine and hauled into the intensive care unit, commonly known as ICU. I waited patiently for Dr. Johansson in this pitiful and joyless ward where father was now referred to as patient Roberts by the medical team. Consistently, a nurse entered and checked father's vitals. However, this time, a senior matron walked into the ICU and asked me to follow her. She said, hang in there, dear. I have telephoned your mother. She will be here in a jiffy. <clears throat> Dr. Johansson will be with you and your mother shortly. I was thankful that mother would be here soon as I began feeling lonely and desperate for support. I quietly waited in the ICU lobby. <clears throat> clippity clop, clippity clop, clippity clop. Mother's sandals were headed towards the ICU lobby and in a split second she reached me. Mother gazed with her fearful eyes and she spoke worriedly. Why didn't you call me, Anastasia? I sadly bowed my head and replied without any excuse. I am sorry, mother. Mother lifted my chin, peered deep into my eyes and read my heart. I know that you're feeling extremely frightened and so am I. However, let's not jump to any conclusions until we meet the doctor. Dr. Johansson called mother and me into his office. As we slowly ambled in, he spread his sorrowful smile across his wrinkled face and pointed his palms to the two empty chairs for us to settle down in. We obediently obeyed but with heavy hearts filled with anxiety. Dr. Johansson explained, Mrs. Roberts, your husband has experienced a dreadful neurological condition, a brain complication. Mother and I had question marks expressed on our faces. Nevertheless, the doctor continued. Mr. Roberts is suffering from a brain aneurysm, a type of brain tumor. It is similar to a bubble in the brain, filled with blood and ready to burst. Blood bursting sent a creepy shrill down my spine. This man father was in deep trouble. Mother was completely silent by this horrific news. Dr. Johansson continued, we need to perform a surgery on Mr. Roberts urgently as he is critical. If not done earlier, the worst would be paralyzed for life, a life in a wheelchair. Hearing these words, mother dawdled slightly as it was clearly noticed that she was taken aback. She desperately whispered to herself, surgery, paralyzed, wheelchair. She quickly asked Dr. Johansson, when can my husband be operated and what would be the cost of the surgery? Dr. Johansson said with a strong voice, immediate surgery or else the worst. Mother took a deep breath and the doctor reluctantly continued. The cost of the surgery is 30,000 American dollars. On hearing this, mother controlled her tears and asked to be excused from Dr. Johansson's office. She held my hand and walked out. Mother broke down in the ICU lobby. Her tears were rolling down her sapphire blue eyes. She frantically spoke to me. How will we find this kind of money for your father, especially in Somalia's crippled economy? 
I am already working double shifts at the college just to pay for our house rent and food. I was not able to digest that mother who was always a strong and courageous woman was having a traumatic mental collapse. My eyes welled up like an ocean of tears which flowed like a silent waterfall. I was never accustomed to see father and mother both in a devastating situation. As mother saw me wistfully crying, she quickly gathered all her willpower. Mother lifted my chin, cupped her soft supple hands on my face, peered deep into my teenage eyes and hugged me with the deepest compassion. In our bear hug, my teary eyes shut tightly. I poured my heart out. I never want you or father to leave me, kick the bucket or shrivel up and droop like flowers. Mother passionately kissed my forehead and said, your father and I will love you until eternity, as you are our only and loving daughter. In our cradled hug, I knew these words had embossed as a blueprint in my mind, heart and soul. I smiled reassuringly. Even though father would be in a traumatic surgery, I wiped my tears. Mother never lost hope. She called and began solemnly pleading relatives and friends for a smudge of financial support. However, in her time of need, everyone turned their back against her. Fortunately, mother was a loyal, trustworthy and hardworking teacher at her college. She went to the college and narrated father's sorrowful story to the board of directors. Mother returned to the ICU ward with a cheerful smile on her face, held me around my waist and said, my college's board of directors, within a moment of goodwill, granted me a loan of 30,000 American dollars. Mother and I strode to the cash counter at the hospital, smiling and deposited the check. We presented the receipt to the Somalian matron at Dr. Johansson's office. She said, let me give Mr. Roberts receipt immediately to the doctor and quickly left the nurse's station and walked to Dr. Johansson's office. Suddenly, there was a loud siren from the ICU ward. A junior Somalian nurse rushed towards the ward. The matron followed and Dr. Johansson was running too. Mother and I were confused. We were terrified and praying that the siren was not from father's bed. We hastily followed the medical team and were alarmed to see father. Father began breathing heavily again. His eyes were shut, but his left arm was jerking in an extremely abnormal condition. Whereas his right arm was completely lifeless. Father was squirming painfully. Four nurses steadily bolstered us into the ICU lobby and they returned to Dr. Johansson. Two of the African nurses drew the green curtains around father's bed. All we could hear was the rigorous sound of the machine. Beep, beep, beep continuously with Dr. Johansson's quick and loud instructions to the nurses. The next moment, Mother and I heard squeak, squeak, squeak of the hospital stretcher with father being wheeled out of the ICU ward. Dr. Johansson came to the ICU lobby and exasperatingly said, We are taking Mr. Roberts into the operation theater immediately. He has suffered a severe brain stroke because his blood bubble has burst. We will do our best to save his life. You can do your best to pray to God. Within a blink of an eye, the doctor sped like lightning to perform father's traumatic surgery. Now, with our heavy hearts, all mother and I could do was pray to God. We gloomily sat outside the operation theater and spoke deeply. Let us pray with all our heart and soul to the deepest core of our being for your father. Mother silently prayed with her books and I prayed by writing my heart out to God in the form of a poem. Dear Heavenly God, deep down in my heart lies fear in my heart, for Father's life is at your mercy. His life comes to a bound, not at the best of times, but at the worst of times, for Father's life is at your mercy. Minute after minute, my eyes blink to catch a glimpse of Father. Save him, God, as Father's life is at your mercy. Love from his loving daughter, Anastasia. By this moment, it felt as if mother and I had said the prayers umpteen times during the four-hour traumatic surgery in this African hospital. And slowly, 
the operation doors opened. Each female nurse existed one by one from the surgery without any expression on their faces. Mother and I kept peering and waiting for Dr. Johansson to exit. Every minute was crucial. Every second was heart-wrenching. And finally, Dr. Johansson appeared. Immediately following were four female nurses pushing father's hospital stretcher very slowly. Dr. Johansson peered at us with grey discomforting glare. He spoke with a heavy heart. Mrs. Roberts and Anastasia, we had done our ultimate best to help Mr. Roberts in surgery. However, he suffered another major brain stroke while on the operating table, which caused blood to spread across his entire brain and paralyze him from the neck to his legs. He became a weak vegetable on the operating table, yet Mr. Roberts was not ready to give up. He, my medical team and me still didn't give up hope. Mother and I were in a state of distress. What was Dr. Johansson saying? Yet Dr. Johansson continued. Mr. Roberts was a strong fighter, but on the third brain attack, we lost him. We lost him. We lost him. Mother and I felt as if our world came to an end. We crashed into an oblivious, heart-wrenching state. Dr. Johansson and the female nurses held our hands sympathetically and walked with us to say our last farewell to father after his traumatic surgery after his traumatic surgery after father's traumatic surgery thank you